Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. I'm here. Kevin has written me a script. Billy Milligan, man of 24 faces or violent con man. Ooh, I mean violent con man. Maybe there's murder, but maybe there's no murder today, which makes for a less popular episode. But it does make for a little mental health break for old fact boy here. Because just before this, I, I actually recorded two of these in a row. Uh, well, this will be the second. I recorded one before this, which was all about violent murder. So this is nice. Nice little break for me. yippity do. Let's go. We need well, some, well, something. Something, uh, something is missing. missing. Yes, I know what's missing. Oh, the format of the show, if you're new here, is I've never read this before. It's a brand new exploration. Kevin wrote it. I'm going to read it. We're going to enjoy it together. Probably not. It's about crime and violence and con men, which I find surprising, like, I don't know, con men and all of this stuff, like, I love all that shit, like, Catch Me If You Can movie, read you about all these guys, I just find it super interesting. Although much of the myth surrounding the insanity defense has been dispelled, there is still a large misconception over exactly how common it is or on what grounds it can be applied. There are a lot of common mental disorders, so common that it's estimated 26% of adults in America at any time are suffering from a diagnosable disorder. I could totally, like one in four? It wouldn't surprise me if it was higher. Like the only reason we don't, the only reason we might think that higher is because we've just been like way under diagnosing mental stuff because for the longest time, like healthcare is just focused on the physical well-being rather than the mental well-being. And I mean, it's still super, super like not taken care of. However, suffering from anxiety or depression is not grounds for an insanity plea. Likewise, your diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder is not going to save you from any jail time unless your specific compulsion happens to be that you can't leave a room without turning the lights off for it three times and then stabbing somebody 17 times. And even there, I don't think that's going to fly for an insanity defense. Because mental health diagnoses are nuanced and sometimes subjective, courts sought to put in place standardized rules to help judges and juries evaluate someone's legal competency. The first such rule, called the Minorton Rules, goes all the way back to 1843, and this is an English case, famous English English case. I remember studying this case. This rule was established when Englishman Daniel Norton, and I can't remember how to pronounce it, so I'm sorry about that, assassinated the Prime Minister on the basis that the Prime Minister was conspiring against him, and it became the standard throughout the UK and the United States, and is still used in about half of US states today. I didn't know that. That's interesting. This rule was split into two parts, either of which was considered sufficient grounds for an insanity defense. As the result of a mental disease or other mental defect, the defendant would have to show that they either did not understand what they were doing was wrong, what they were doing was wrong, or that they simply did not understand what they were doing at all. The Minorton rule was a high bar to clear, and it was primarily used in the case of psychopaths and schizophrenics. If a person genuinely believed that they were killing a demon or they were performing an otherwise illegal act on the orders from God himself, they clearly would not understand that what they were doing was wrong. Obviously, orders from God could never be wrong, not even when he told Abraham to kill his own son but stopped him at the last moment, or when he told Jephthah to kill his own daughter and made him go through with it, or when he told Anand to have sex with his brother's wife because the couple weren't having enough children. How is this book okay, but books like Where the Wild Things Are get banned is beyond me. That's because religion is special, Kevin. <laughs> I don't know who reads the Bible anymore, alright? For some reason, I mean, what the f the Bible? There's some crazy shit in there. Some crazy shit. Why, why did Where the Wild Things get banned? What's wrong with where the, where the Wild Things Are? Isn't that just some heartwarming story about where wild things are? I remember this from being a kid. Now I want to go buy it for my kids so I can enjoy Where the Wild Things Are again. Anyway, it was evidence early on that the Minorton Rule was incomplete. So in 1887, the Alabama Supreme Court introduced the irresistible impulse test. The test was designed to include people who knew what they were doing, knew what they were doing was wrong, but literally couldn't help themselves. Unlike the Minorton rule, this would provide criteria by which those suffering from things like mania or paraphilias, abnormal sexual desires, would be covered. The problem with the irresistible impulse test was that, was that it had a higher level of subjectivity and could wind up being overly inclusive. Yeah, I mean, what sort of defense is that? It's like, I just can't stop myself. It's like, what are you doing? I steal. I'm a kleptomaniac. I just can't stop myself from stealing jewels. <laughs> I don't feel like that should be a defense. I mean, it shouldn't be a complete defense. Uh, right? These tests worked well enough for a while, but in 1953, that is a long while, that's like 
60 some 63 66 years the durham rule emerged when a judge decided that reform was needed he felt that the defense failed to show that the defendant durham didn't know right from wrong but that he was still insane the new rule was extremely simplified, stating that an accused is not criminally responsible if his unlawful act was the product of mental disease or mental defect. This is really tricky legal stuff because psychopathy is a mental defect. And psychopaths kill. They serial kill. Are they guilty? Yes. But under this rule, kind of feels like that's a defense. Like someone who serial kills, like someone who commits crimes like this, by the very nature, is not right. They're, they have a disorder. And then how do we reconcile that with this? Hopefully their language throws up some immediate red flags, indeed, because it is extremely broad and subjective. The Durham rule essentially removed both judges and juries from the equation, and the entire test was, hey doc, is this guy a crazy mofo? If the doctor, who was not held to any specific standards for the methodology of their diagnosis, said the person wasn't responsible, end of discussion this test was quickly identified as having these issues <laughs> no surprise and in 1972 it was largely disregarded in favor of the new model penal code this was essentially just a combination of the Norton rule and the irresistible impulse test into a single rule allowing either to be sufficient proof that a person wasn't legally competent the main difference was that instead of focusing on whether the defendant understood their actions were morally wrong it could instead be applied to determine whether they understood that their actions were criminal this whole thing this law stuff i find just endlessly fascinating that the little intricacies and discussions and moral debates i find this so interesting successful uses of insanity defense tend to be major news which is why people are prone to believing that it is more common than it is it's not an attractive defense because it's difficult to prove and because the insanity plea admit means admitting that the defendant committed the crime just that they weren't legally responsible for it in reality only about one percent of criminal cases attempt the insanity defense and only about 25 percent of those are successful so roughly one in 400 cases of course approximately 90 percent of the american population is currently housed in the prison system <laughs> though that number feels a little low uh <laughs> I mean, it's often Kevin's just having fun at those stats where it's like there's a lot of Americans in prison for which means that a big chunk of those that aren't incarcerated avoided jail by being criminally insane. Among those was Billy Milligan, a man who achieved celebrity status by being the first person to successfully use multiple personality disorder as a basis for an insanity defense. Billy would achieve such fame that he got to personally meet with director James Cameron to discuss selling the story of his life. But it was Billy, better known before his arrest as the campus rapist, actually insane, or was he just a run-of-the-mill violent criminal who found a way to exploit the zeitgeist of clinical psychology in the 1970s? This is going to be a very interesting question to deal with in today's episode, so let's crack on. Exactly what you would expect. This should come as no surprise to fans of The Casual Criminalist or tra fans of true crime in general, but Billy had a really shit childhood. Billy's mother, Dorothy Sands, grew up in Ohio. She married a man named Dick Jonas, but the marriage failed due to Dick's drinking problem. After her divorce, Dorothy moved to Miami and got a job as a singer. While in Miami, she met and fell in love with a man named Johnny Morrison, a local comedian and musician. Johnny was already married, but that didn't stop the couple from having three children together. William Stanley Milligan, born on Valentine's Day 1955, was the middle child. He had an older brother, Jim, and a younger sister, Kathy Jo. However, Dorothy hadn't learned her lesson from her first marriage. Johnny was another heavy drinker, and the combination of medical expenses and trying to pay for three children oh, was too much. For him to handle he turned to gambling taking out loans to gamble more and drinking a lot more oh no it's like i've got financial troubles what shall i do gambling will make it better ah! i know desperate people do desperate things but please don't gamble it's just going to make it worse i promise i promise you just don't do it please don't gamble in 1958 dorothy found him slumped over the kitchen table having downed half a bottle of scotch and a bottle of sleeping pills johnny was taken to the hospital and then he survived the ordeal but he was no quitter he wouldn't quit gambling and he wouldn't get drinking so he wasn't going to try quit killing himself either a few months later in january 1959 johnny committed suicide via carbon monoxide poisoning the financial insecurity pressures of being a father and severe addiction all played a role in his suicide but i'd like to think that the guilt of raising three children with his girlfriend of seven years while still being married the entire time was a contributing factor as well yeah it sounds like there were a lot of contributing factors and that's a uh, it's sad it's sad he wasn't abusive this was the second husband he was just uh, uh, financial troubles and addictions and i mean he was having an affair and stuff but 
it's just it's sad. Dorothy apparently must have missed Dick because she moved back to Ohio with her kids where she remarried her ex-husband. Oh, God. I don't like that at all. Don't do that. Unsurprisingly, this marriage lasted less than a year. It was the 1950s, so it's not like Dick's first divorce was going to be the wake-up call he needed to stop drinking and get his life together. He had likely spent most of the previous seven years hanging out with the other barflies, complaining about how awful women were, and wondering how a catch like him was still single. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder why, mate. I wonder why. It's probably because you're a bell. Roughly two years after the divorce, Dorothy met a new man, Chalmer Milligan. The following year, in 1963, the two got married. The good news is that Dorothy had learned her lesson about dating alcoholics, as there don't appear to be any accounts of Chalmer being a heavy drinker. The bad news is that he was going to make Johnny Morrison look like Mr. Rogers. Allegedly. Before we even talk about what kind of man and father Chalmer was, it's important to note that at this point, Billy was eight years old. It had only been four years since his father had committed suicide. Even if Chalmer was the kindest and most patient parent in the world, being on their third father in four years would have to f up Billy and his siblings at least just a little bit. Yeah, this is the sort of childhood that leads to super damaged people. Chalmer, an army veteran, already had two daughters from his previous marriage, a marriage that had ended in divorce on the grounds of gross neglect. Just to be clear, everything about Chalmer moving forward is alleged. This comes from Billy's personal account. His accounts to psychiatrists, which date back to his teenage years before he committed any serious crimes, and the accounts of his siblings. There is a good amount of corroboration to this story, but no charges were ever filed, and thus there is no conviction. So, again, all alleged. Of course, this piece of sh in my opinion, died in 1986, so I doubt his estate is looking to sue anyone to defend his honor. Yeah, that'd be some serious Streisand effect going on right there, guys. But I just want to be clear that, again, this is just allegations. Now, with those legal compulsories out of the way, Chalmer was allegedly a sadistic, abusive pile of human garbage. All, or at least the vast majority, of his abuse was directed at Billy, which isn't really uncommon. By only abusing one child, that would theoretically leave him four more to vouch for what a wonderful father he was. Singling out the weakest or most timid child could also decrease the chances that the child would ever come forward about the abuse. Billy wasn't the youngest child, but he was the younger of the two boys, and it seems that Chalmer may have been more interested in carrying out his sadistic act on a boy than a girl. The first of those alleged sadistic acts, how about some good old-fashioned sodomy? Oh, God. Is an abuse enough? Do we have to go down the sexual path as well? With kids? Piece of sh Allegedly. That's already something terrible. What if I told you it gets way worse? Oh, God. Kevin, did we start this off with con man? And I was getting excited about a con man episode where there wasn't horrible, like, child abuse and all of this stuff, and now it's like, oh, he cons the legal system into, allegedly, into making people think that he wasn't a murderer. <laughs> In my opinion. Actually, I don't even know if that's my opinion yet, because we haven't read this thing, and maybe he does have this condition, and that's fair. Let's see. The court seemed to think so, apparently. There were plenty of beatings to be had, but a punch in the face is pretty mundane as far as child abuse goes, and Chalmer wasn't one to half ass his douchebaggery. Instead, he would hang Billy from the ceiling by his fingers and toes, not his arms and legs, so that he could whack his adopted son like a piñata. When all else failed and the interactive personal abuse wasn't enough, Chalmer would simply bury Billy alive. Again, all the details of abuse are allegations for which he was never charged despite corroboration with Billy's siblings. This alleged abuse began just months after Dorothy and Chalmer got married, and it was the first of instance of Chalmer sodomizing Billy that psychiatrists would say was the trigger for his personality to splinter. But we'll get to that later. In 1970, shortly after Billy's 15th birthday, he was suspended from his junior high school. The reason for his suspension was given that he would go into trance like states and just wander around the town. The same month, he was committed to the Children's Unit of Columbus State Hospital for Psychiatric Treatment, where he was diagnosed with hysterical neurosis. Hysterical neurosis is an outdated term, and the former diagnosis has been bifurcated into both conversion disorder and disassociative disorders. He was released after a few months, but his parents were urged to have him continue therapy. It does not seem like this happens, but if it did, it certainly didn't help. Also, saying that he was released from the hospital is a bit generous, but he was actually thrown out of the psychiatric hospital because his behavior was way too disruptive. When you're going to get thrown out of the psychiatric hospital because your behavior is too disruptive, maybe that's a sign that you need to be in the psychiatric bus hospital, perhaps? Maybe? Medicine? Come on. Despite having been suspended from junior high and committed for the remainder of the school year, Billy began high school that fall. Thanks, American education system there. Things all went okay, but not great for a couple of years, with Billy attending high school and working part-time jobs, none of which he was able to hold down 
for very long. After two years of high school, Billy and his disruptive behavior were expelled at the age of 17. He immediately enlisted in the Navy, but after two months, he was thrown out for being unable to adapt to Navy life. Billy's childhood was tumultuous. That could be a twist turning point, right? I feel like when I read that sentence, if this was a happy ending story, he'd be like, Andy turned his life around in the Navy as it taught him discipline. And no. Billy's childhood was tumultuous and full of disappointment. He went from one alcoholic father to another alcoholic father to an horribly abusive piece of garbage, allegedly. He didn't really finish high school, was thrown out. He didn't really finish junior high, was thrown out of high school, was thrown out of the Navy, and was even thrown out of the psychiatric ward that should have been full of doctors capable of helping him cope with his traumatic upbringing. Up to this point, it would be easy to feel bad for Billy Milligan. Abuse tends to perpetrate a cycle of more abuse, so it's unsurprising many criminals have tragic backstories. Help oh, Simon even felt sympathetic to John Wayne Gacy while listening to the tale of his childhood. If you're currently feeling compassion and sympathy towards Billy, I'd say you'd be justified for doing so. But get it out of your system now, because it's time that I remind you of the criminal nickname that the media gave him. The Campus Rapist It only took a couple of months after being discharged from the Navy before Billy found himself in trouble with the law. Billy and a friend picked up some women who would go to the police a few days later to accuse them of rape. The pair were arrested on charges of rape, assault, kidnapping, although the kidnapping charges would later be dropped. Billy's defense for these actions was unusual at best. According to his account, the women were sex workers. As he told it, the issue arose because he was unable to perform sexually, and so he and his friend didn't pay them. The judge wasn't having any of that, and they were found guilty. However, Billy was still just 17, so he wouldn't be sent off to prison. Instead, he would serve six months at a juvenile detention camp. It was around this time that Dorothy would finally divorce Charmer, but the damage from his abuse was already done. Yeah, he's 17, close to 18. He's out of the house now, right? You got it. You'd be, you'd be gone. And so, who cares? Is he, the, the, he's already ruined. Following his release from GV, Billy began working as a security guard for an arms and drug dealer. Wait, <laughs> do you call that a security guard? Isn't that just like a heavy? Like, I don't think that's a job title. You work for a criminal. That's what he claimed. Anyway, as far as I can tell, this has not been verified, but he had to be doing something for the next two years. So, well, why not? When he wasn't busy working as a hired goon, there you go, hired goon, security guard. It seems Billy spent his free time trolling the streets as a petty thug. It sounds like he's living Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> What's he doing? He's just going around, looking for money on the ground, beating people up, taking their money, doing missions. <laughs> Jeez. But when you put it that way, it doesn't sound that good to me either. In late 1974, Billy was approached by two cross-dressing men at a rest stop. It's unclear whether approached means they were actually intended to engage with him or just walking in his general direction. But given that it was a highway rest stop, it's probably the former. I suspect you're unfamiliar with their reputation, Simon. So let's just say that if dogging was a thing in America, these rest stops were where it would happen. Oh my. I was not familiar with that, and now I am. Uh, Billy assaulted the two men and stole their purses. Early the next year, he took part in the robbery of a drugstore. He clearly wasn't a very good criminal because for the second time, he'd be arrested within days of his crimes. This time, he needs to read those rules. There's, uh, there's rules for casual criminals if you're new here. Um, someone, Elfie McEl Elferton, a commenter on the regular commenter on the YouTube videos, occasionally compiles them, and there's many. There's probably hundreds of them now. He's my favorite artist. This time, Billy had the good sense to plead guilty. He was 20 years old, so this time he would be serving his two-year sentence in big boy prison instead of a juvenile facility. In April of 1977, Billy was released from prison. Like most people who spent time in American prisons, he was fully reformed and successfully reintegrated into society. Ah, sarcasm, sarcasm. Prison makes worse criminals. And if you believe that, feel free to contact me privately about some wonderful investments opportunities. <laughs> he did manage to stay under the radar for a whole six months, but that was not going to last. On October the 14th, 1977, Billy pulled a gun on an optometry student in the Ohio State University parking lot. He took her from the parking lot to a nearby wooded area where he raped her, then made her write a check and cash it for him. What the f*** are you up to? Bro, why are you combining your crimes? Don't combine your crimes. He would repeat this two more times, once on October the 22nd with a nurse and once on October the 26th with an undergraduate student. All three women were kidnapped from OSU, raped, and then robbed. It's cashing a check. So you'd write a check to yourself and then go to the bank and cash that check. This must be some old-timey, like, instead of using an ATM thing? In the 70s, I guess? Can't you just go to the, wouldn't you just go to the bank and withdraw money? It's weird. I don't know. I don't understand. Uh, checks. 
<laughs> How very historical. It's quaint. We've already established that Billy is not a very good criminal, so fortunately he was arrested the, d the day after the third rape, only 13 days after his evil crime spree had begun. Three rapes and I... Uh, the, 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 what's it called? Fraud? Theft? I'm not sure when you force someone to cash a check and steal in their money. Obviously a crime. Um, this is going to be a long-ass stretch in prison, mate. This has got to be 20 something years at least for three because they'll make you serve them consecutively because well it's rape so you're going away for a time i get the feeling he's not though which is weird let's see billy had already been arrested for rape before when he was 17 so when one of the victims was shown a book of mug shots from known sex offenders she was easily able to pick him out of the lineup his fingerprints were also found in the car of one of the victims there was more than enough evidence for a warrant and upon searching billy's home they found a gun and personal items that he had stolen from the victims as trophies the gun was a clear parole violation so he was arrested and taken to our high state penitentiary to await trial for three counts of kidnapping rape and robbery ah oh, it is robbery okay there we go based on the physical evidence and and the ease with which all three women identified him, it should have been slam dunk for the prosecution. However, before it even went to trial, there were some peculiarities. Oh, so are these the crimes? We're so early in today's episode, I thought that there would be more crimes committed, but I guess these are the crimes that he's doing that multiple personalities defense on. Let's see. One of the three victims said that Billy spoke with a German accent. Another said that he was extremely nice the whole time, and that had she met him under different circumstances, the kind where she wasn't being raped at gunpoint, she would have considered dating him. That's a weird thing to say. This is very weird. I can't imagine how nice this guy must have been for her to admit that after what had happened. Regardless, the important part here is that even though the victims had no trouble identifying Billy, their descriptions of his personality were very different. Many will point to this as proof that his diagnosis was real. After all, why would someone go through the trouble of faking an elaborate mental disorder while committing their crimes? Well, maybe because they think they're going to be able to use that elaborate mental disorder to get away with their crimes after the fact. Although maybe the fact that he's not a very good criminal makes that unlikely. He's, he just feels a bit dim, so I just don't think it's likely that he thought that far ahead, and I, it's probably probably real, isn't it? The obvious answer is that it will make it much more believable when you try to use that as defense in court. Yes. The supervisor of the OSU police investigators drove Billy to the Columbus police headquarters following Following the arrest in his home. He said of the trip that he didn't know what was going on, but that it felt like he was talking to different people at different times. Billy also claimed to have no knowledge of the crimes and didn't know what he was being arrested for. Even if he did lack memory of those specific crimes, dudes on parole and the police just found a gun in his home and arrest woman Brant under those circumstances shouldn't be that confusing. Once Billy was at the Ohio State Penitentiary, he began meeting with doctors and undergoing psychiatric evaluations so that his public defenders could prepare their defense. We talk a lot on both both the casual criminalist and in society in general about the power of high price lawyers. So I just really want to emphasize what legends the public defenders Gary Schwachart and Judy Stevenson are for having pulled off this defense. It would have probably been a lot better for society as a whole if they hadn't, but it's still really impressive. So credit where credit is due. The defense that Billy's lawyers went with was that the reason he appeared to have no memory of the crimes was that because he wasn't the one that committed them. Not just these three rapes at OSU, but the previous robberies that Billy perpetrated weren't actually committed by him either. All of these crimes were the result of his multiple personality disorder, now known as Dissociative Identity Disorder, or DID. When he was first evaluated by doctors while in custody, Billy was diagnosed with acute schizophrenia. Other doctors would later diagnose him with histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and antisocial traits. However, Dr. Cornelia Wilbur was brought in to consult on the case. In 1977, she undoubtedly was the most famous psychiatrist in the United States, not the entire world, and she was the one who led the charge for the diagnosis of DID, and we'll talk a bit more about Cornelia later. Using his new diagnosis of DID, Billy's lawyers were able to have him found not guilty by reason of insanity. Billy was the first person to ever successfully use multiple personalities as defense. I mean, Gary and Judy were the first people to use the defense, and it was almost entirely on the basis of Cornelia's diagnosis, but Billy is always the one that gets the credit. But if Billy wasn't guilty and didn't rape those women, then who did? That would be 19-year-old lesbian Adelana. She was one of 10 distinct personalities found to inhabit the body of Billy Milligan, though further sessions with psychiatrists would discover that there were another 14 personalities held prisoner in the darkest recesses of his mind. The 24 Faces of Billy Milligan 
Before we discuss Billy's 24 different personalities, I need to throw in a disclaimer here. I normally do my best to stay as impartial as possible while presenting the evidence in a case. I may make the occasional side comment labeled as my own opinion and not objective fact, and in an unsolved case, I'll share my favorite theory at the end. That's going to be impossible here as I'm extraordinarily biased. DID is the most controversial condition printed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, and many psychiatrists believe that it should be removed entirely. Yeah, I've actually made a video about it on another channel that I host, and it's it's really controversial. Like, a lot of people just don't think it's real and that it shouldn't be in the DSM. So there's that whole thing. There is heavy debate over whether multiple personalities are a real thing, and I'm firmly of the belief that they're not. It may be possible that they exist in very rare cases, but currently the diagnosis is anything but scientific. Many sufferers of DID do not present symptoms of the disorder until after beginning therapy, indicating that they are either intentionally or subconsciously steered in that direction by the doctors themselves. Patients of these doctors are generally rewarded for showing signs of the disorder, and the more identities the re they reveal, the more validation they're going to receive. One of the most damning things of all is that research consistently shows that it is impossible for these psychiatrists to tell the difference between a person that has been previously diagnosed with DID and someone who is faking it for the sake of the experiment. Yeah, this is where it's like, is this really science? I know medicine is not like and psychiatry and stuff and psychology and all of that stuff is you know it's not always 100 percent wedded to like you know super 100 percent provable stuff and there's more speculation and stuff like this but this doesn't feel like science does it it doesn't it's possible i'm wrong and that did is real but it is currently an unscientific and unprovable diagnosis which calls all diagnoses of the disorder into question even if it is real there is no doubt in my mind that billy was a thousand percent faking to get out of his crimes Wow, Kevin, this is a strong opinion to put forward, especially because the courts have said that they have a different opinion to you. Now that my personal bias has been fully disclosed, please allow me to be a shitty asshole while I sarcastically introduce you to Billy's supposed 24 personalities referred to as alters. First, there is the 22-year-old Billy, the core and most likely only personality. It would be weird if he wasn't on this list. Next is Arthur. Arthur is 23, a sophisticated and well-educated Englishman who completely ran the show. He was an expert in science and medicine with a focus on hematology. These supposed credentials were never actually put to the test, as any time Billy was in a situation where someone could challenge the alleged claims of one of his alters, he would conveniently switch to another personality. But hey, he must have been decent-ish at faking a British accent. Arthur was in charge of The Spot, the name he used to refer to whichever alter was in control of Billy at the time. He had total control over which personality could use The Spot. Though Billy was unaware of his supposed alternate personalities and had no memories when they were in control, in control, all of his alters were aware of one another and shared memories. Not only was Arthur in charge of The Spot, he was also one of two personalities that had the authority to clarify one of the others as undesirable. There were 14 undesirables, the personalities that were not discovered late until later in Billy's treatment. In addition to being the gatekeeper to the spot, Arthur was primarily used in times when intellectual thinking was required. Just how smart was Arthur supposed to be? A lot of sources report that he had a genius level IQ of 150. Better sources note that this was a total lie. All of Billy's personalities were subjected to an IQ test, and the scores ranged from 67 to 129. Arthur simply refused to take the test. You can't fake a high IQ. You can fake a low IQ by answering the questions wrong, but you can't fake a high one by answering faking the questions right. So I guess his real IQ is pretty high at 129. I thought he was a bit dim because he was not doing these crimes very well. This whole thing is explained pretty easily. Billy had an IQ of 129, which would put him at above average intelligence, but not exceptionally gifted. I've taken plenty of IQ tests in my day because I think they're fun, and because I incorrectly thought having Mensa on my CV would help me get a job after college. <laughs> a little humble brag there, Kevster. Hey, hey. I think he's smart because he's the only kid I know. Because, uh, and now before anyone gets angry at me for my comments, about ragging on DID, but then talking about IQ. Yes, I realize IQ tests are also bullshit. Anyway, despite my familiarity with IQ tests, I can only score as high on a test as I can score. Yeah, exactly what I said. You can't fake high. Let's say I tested 168, which if is the case, is uh, extremely high. Then I wanted to claim I had multiple personalities. I could claim one of those personalities was astonishingly brilliant in comparison to me, but I couldn't get a score to support that claim. However, what I could do was deliberately tank the test in various degrees to show that the other personalities range from developmentally challenged up to my actual intelligence level. This almost certainly is what Billy did. He then just refused to take the test as Arthur, so that they wouldn't have proof that Arthur wasn't as intelligent as he claimed to be. Basically, 
Arthur was the random loudmouth online or at dinner parties that goes about talking about how amazing they are, but they never really have anything to back it up with. <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> these people exist. They're like, I'm doing this brilliant thing. I'm working on this great project. And it's like, how's that going? It's like, yeah, you, you, it's early stages. And it's just those. It's annoying. It's annoying. I don't like it. Speaking of making wild and substantiated claims, Arthur could also read and write Arabic fluently. This was also, of course, never tested. If they tried, I'm sure he would have let someone else take control of the spot instead. However, despite claiming that he could read and write Arabic, when he encountered a fellow patient at the mental institution who actually could do this, he had that person write in Arabic for him, which, why well, it's not at all suspicious, is it? <laughs> Next was Reagan Vadaskovanich, nicknamed the keeper of hate. Reagan's name is actually a clever portmanteau of the words rage and again. All right, so clever. <laughs> it was brilliant. That's the sort of thing that only someone with an IQ of 129 could come up with. He was Yugoslavian and spoke with a Slavic accent. He was also fluent in Serbian, something that was equally as unsubstantiated as Arthur's claim of being fluent in Arabic. Reagan was the only alter to have a last name, likely added to sell the idea that he was Yugoslavian. He was also the one who was responsible for committing the robberies that originally landed Billy in jail and is the one that was working for the arms and drugs dealer. Reagan was purported to be an expert in various weapons and of karate. Billy and many of his alters were artists, but Reagan would draw exclusively in black and white because he was colorblind. It's not how colorblindness works, is it? This seems to indicate that he was supposed to have a completely achromatic vision, which is exceedingly rare, and it's also the result of physiology. It's not like an alternate personality could change a person physically, right? Well, yeah, you'd think that. And all of this so far, I'm like totally coming down on the side of Kevin. I think this is kind of nonsense. And also, just is building my level of respect for those public defenders who managed to pull this shit off because it's wild. <laughs> People who believe Billy seem to think otherwise. Reagan was allegedly strong, like abnormally strong, somehow stronger than Billy was. This was explained by Reagan having the ability to control his flow of adrenaline to give himself seemingly superhuman strength. Oh yeah, he also weighed at least 10 pounds more than Billy. I mean, the problem is with this argument, Kevin, about the realism and whether these personalities are distinct is no one is making the argument that these are real people with other knowledge trapped in his body. What the argument is, is that are they distinct fake personalities? They can all be made up. They're all absolutely made up because there's no way that a Yugoslavian man is hiding inside this American man's body. Like, his mind is in there. It's just that's physically impossible. But the argument being made is does Billy believe this? Are, does he have an awareness of these other personalities? Obviously, he can't speak Arabic, but that doesn't take away from the argument of multiple personality disorders, because we all know that these personalities are not actually real. Despite being a criminal, Reagan wasn't lumped in with the other undesirables. He was kept around because he did what needed to be done in order to provide for the family. Instead, he was the other of Billy's alters that had the ability to designate somebody as undesirable. Next, we come to Adelana, the perpetrator of the rapes. Adelana was a 19-year-old lesbian who would cook and clean for the others and often wrote poetry. You might think that committing rape would have got Adelana lumped in with the other undesirables, but she had a special power. None of the other nurses knew this, but Adelana had the ability to wish control of the spot without Arthur's permission and to prevent the others from remembering what had happened while she was in control. That meant that she alone was privy to the fact that the rapes had happened at all. It's convenient, isn't it? Her motivation for committing these atrocities was because she was a shy introvert who was desperate for human touch and companionship. Um, you need to, I, I don't know if this person understands what companionship is, because that's not rape. What the fuck? Then there was Alan. Alan was a con man and skilled manipulator, and he was the one the most commonly interacted with the outside world, at least allegedly. It's not like Billy was actually monitored in the outside world, though, and as we'll learn later on, he absolutely should have been. Alan was also right-handed, despite Billy and all of the other alters being left-handed, as if using your off-hand isn't something literally anyone could learn to do, given proper motivation. He was also the only alter that smoked cigarettes. To some people, this is a smoking gun that obviously these personalities were real, since nicotine is physically addicting. Um, uh, that is not strong evidence in any way whatsoever. The personalities are not real. Oh, Jesus Christ. That you're still, your brain would still have that physical addiction. That physical addiction is going nowhere. You're just getting control of it. Very strong motivation to do so, remember. 
However, if Billy was only smoking one cigarette every few days or something, however often he decided to be Alan, it's not likely it would be enough to cause a serious addiction. Besides, if only one alter smoked, then it's not like Billy would be carrying cigarettes around with him. He'd have to ask the doctors for them. This would make it more of a blatantly performative act than any actual trait of the personality. Oh yeah, and he played the drums, and he painted portraits. Tim? This is getting ridiculous. We know Billy did a lot of art, hence, men, hence many of his alters also painted and sketched, but I'm not sure whether he was musically inclined. It's unlikely that a doctor was going to give him a drum kit in the middle of a psychiatric hospital, so this is almost certainly another unverified claim. Tommy was often confused for Alan, probably because inventing 24 completely distinct personalities is really hard, so there were bound to be some overlap of convenience. Tommy was a master escape artist and allegedly escaped from, escape ja uh, from a straight jacket while in police custody. When they were explained to him that the jackets were intended for people who were thought to be a danger to themselves, Tommy showed them the trick and taught them how to tie a straitjacket so that nobody could escape. Christine was a three-year-old girl who suffered from dyslexia. This should be an irrelevant detail because I don't think there's a lot of three-year-olds out there who are reading anyway, but Arthur taught her to read and write despite her disability. One at the age of three. <laughs> I'd wait, <laughs> my kid's about to turn three. My, <laughs> they're a long way from writing. They can maybe trace the letters. They can trace letters. That's about it. I'd wager this entire story was because it's not that hard to deliberately read slowly or pretend you're having difficulty reading. Pretending to be completely illiterate would be very difficult. You may be thinking, no, it's not. Just don't read stuff. That's exactly what I was thinking, Kevin, actually. But if a psychiatrist keeps handing pieces of paper to a person that's pretending they can't read, eventually there's going to be some recognition. They won't admit they could read anything, and they probably won't realize that anything happens, but there'll be their hints of understanding in their eyes. Just a tiny micro-expression that tells the doctor they absolutely recognize recognize the words in front of them, and they are pretending not to be able to read it. Fair enough. Christine was referred to as the corner girl because she was the personality that would take over when Billy was when Billy had to stand in the corner for disrupting a class as a child. She had originally been created during Billy's childhood as an imaginary friend, but it is believed that she became one of his alters at the time his abuse at the hands of Chalmer started. Although Christine had no useful skills beyond cheerfully drawing pictures of flowers and butterflies, the others vowed to never let her be labeled as undesirable because she was the first alter created. Similarly, Billy himself was not allowed to be labeled as undesirable because he was the original identity. They just rarely ever left him in control. Chris was Christine's older brother. Oh my god, there are so many. How do you even remember all of this shit? He was 10 years old, enjoyed gen gen generic 10-year-old stuff, and likely only existed so that Billy could get the number of personalities to a nice round number before introducing the 14 undesirables. He was rarely given control because he served little purpose, but he enjoyed playing the harmonica and couldn't wait to learn to drive. Being only 10 years old, he obviously wasn't allowed to drive a car except for that one time. Despite not being able to see over the dashboard, Chris was once able to take the car out for a drive by stationing four of the other alters at the corners of the car and having them direct him. What the fuck? I swear to God, this is really what some people believe happened. Apparently a jury believed this shit. This is wild. Can't believe people... This is so stupid. Danny was afraid of people, especially men, but he liked to paint. He would only paint still lives and refused to paint landscapes because they reminded him of the time Charmer made him dig his own grave. Finally, there was eight-year-old David. David was the keeper of pain and was put into the spot to absorb the final pain of all the other altars. These are the main ten altars that were seen. But as we said, Bully was the man of 24 faces, so we're not even halfway done. Oh, God. What a nightmare. At least these ones were all banished, so their stories are a lot shorter. Are we really going through all these? This is just like a it's like a journey through a crazy man's mind. I I just find this to be such I, I I'm totally just coming around to Kevin's opinion and this is all just utter nonsense, isn't it? The undesirables. Here we find Billy's basket of deplorable personalities that existed but weren't allowed to come out and play for a variety of reasons. Philip was a cheap dime store hood with a thick Brooklyn accent. I assume it was clear when Philip was in the spot because he would saunter around town yelling, I'm walking here! A cars. He was <laughs> terrible accent, I apologize. He was marked as undesirable on account of being a criminal. Perhaps if he had physically impossible superhuman abilities like Reagan, then he could have stuck around. Kevin was another small time criminal. He was considered to be less intelligent and motivating the villain, making him even less desirable. On behalf of all Kevins, fuck you, Billy. <laughs> yeah, because Kevin's the author of this piece. He's also called Kevin. Walter was a big game hunter from Australia with an excellent sense of direction. Obviously, he had never been to Australia, nor had he hunted big game, but he was banished for borrowing a gun to shoot a crow. 
For the safety and protection of the family, only Reagan was allowed to handle guns. Oh my god. It's like listening to an edgy teenager's story about some bullshit that they came up with. Ugh. April, frankly, shouldn't have been marked as undesirable. Her singular mission in life was to murder Charmer, and honestly, I think that would have been okay. Did you forget my decidedly pro-murder stance, Simon? <laughs> yeah, Charmer was a bell. I would, the world would be better off without him. It wouldn't have been okay, legally speaking, but if Billy's only cl- crime was murdering Charmer instead of multiple rapes, I'd feel a lot better about him having gotten a pass from the court. Yeah, if Charmer was there, I'd be like, oh no, Charmer's dead. The child abusive pedophile rapist. What a shame. <laughs> But no, instead he raped three innocent women and stole their money. Samuel was the only practitioner of religion among all 24 altars. Like Billy's biological father, Samuel was Jewish. There are conflicting reports as to why he was marked as undesirable. Some sources cite that this was because he sold off paintings that had belonged to other altars. Others say this was because he was judgmental and a self-righteous prick. Whichever the reason, or perhaps because of a combination of both, Arthur banished Samuel away. He was allowed to take control of the spot exactly once per year so that he could fast on Yom Kippur, but that's it. No Passover, no Tish Bav, no Rosh Hanasha, no Sukkoth. Oh my god, all these Jewish holidays I have no idea how to pronounce. <laughs> Samuel got exactly one day per year, and frankly, as an undesirable, he should have been grateful to get even that much. Mark was referred to by the others as the workhorse or the zombie. He would do nothing unless he was told to, and he would do monotonous tasks for hours at a time without complaint. Mark wasn't so much an alternate personality as he was literally everybody who has a job they didn't like. He was marked as undesirable because he was too suggestible and would do anything that he was told. If this was a movie, Steve would be the comic relief. Oh, it just goes on and on and on with all these nonsense characters. Jesus. He was a megalomaniac that didn't believe in the existence of Billy. Instead, he believed he was the core personality and all the others were his alters. Oh, that wacky Steve. He was declared undesirable because he was rude and condescending and nearly everyone got in hot water while Billy was in prison. And just bear in mind, everybody, this is probably all here because it was in court and this was like public records or whatever. This is so crazy. Jason was known as the pressure valve. He would fly into fits of rage and throw tantrums to let off steam. This behavior was deemed as an, appropri- an inappropriate way to deal with anger, so Jason had to go sit on the sidelines. Rob was a daydreamer. He was a little man with big plans, none of which he could be bothered to even attempt to see through. He wasn't bad or dangerous, but Arthur felt that he didn't contribute anything to the group, and so that was that. Sean was a little deaf boy, and the others mostly assumed he was developmentally challenged. He would make buzzing noises to feel the vi- to feel the vibrations in his head. Sean also wasn't bad. Arthur just felt that there wasn't any benefit to being deaf later in life, so he just didn't bring anything useful to the table. At this point, it's revealed that there's a sort of hierarchy among the undesirables. Most of them were cast off into the shadows, never to be heard from again, except when it was convenient for Billy's narrative. Sean wasn't fully banished since he didn't do anything wrong. He was just never allowed to take control of the spot. It's a shame because I'd really love to have a lot of witness accounts of Billy pretending to be deaf while being surrounded by a cacophony of distractions. Timothy was another little boy. He had also experienced sexual abuse at the hands of Charmer. Despite being a child, he had a job at a florist shop somehow, although this was one of the jobs that Billy genuinely had as a teenager before being expelled from high school. When a gay man came into the florist and flirted with Timothy, he got scared and voluntarily banished himself. Martin was Arthur, but louder. He pretended to be a genius to impress others, but was even more of a braggart about it. He wanted to usurp power from Arthur, so Arthur banished him before he could get the chance. And finally, 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 there was the teacher who is inexplicably always lumped in with the undesirables. It's probably just because he wasn't one of the original ten that were revealed. The teacher didn't emerge until Billy had already been undergoing therapy for a while, and he was the attempt to fuse all of the personalities into one. How successful these attempts were varied based on Billy's personal needs. I know my descriptions have been biased and a bit condescending, but I promise you these are the actual facts of Billy's presentation of DID that are accepted by those that believe this diagnosis was accurate. This is so wild. I just don't believe in this. I just don't believe it. And I'm, I'm really beginning to think that that video that I made on the other channel about it was all just like talking about how it's nonsense. Even if DID is indeed real, this roller coaster ride of bullshit isn't it. Billy's story and his presentation isn't consistent with itself or with how DID is believed to present. His changes 
from one altar to another also always included some grand gesture or change of facial expression like he knew he was just putting on a show for the doctors to understand how he could have not only been given this diagnosis by a trained psychiatrist but also have been found not guilty as a result of it we have to go back to dr cornelia wilbur without her billy would have to stick with his original diagnosis of acute schizophrenia something that was unlikely to excuse his actions it was cornelia who led the charge for his diagnosis and cornelia who poisoned the psychiatric well for generations sybil Sybil was a book published in 1973. It sold 6 million copies and was made into a TV movie in 1976, the year before Billy's trial. It was billed as a non-fiction book that detailed the life of a woman named Sybil. Shocking. <laughs> and her treatment by Cornelia Wilbur. Her name was changed to protect her identity, but the readers who were local to the protagonist immediately recognized that her actual name was Shirley Mason. As best I can tell, the story behind the book is all a matter of uncontested public records. But let's just throw a big allegedly in before all of this, just in case. Yeah, I love that allegedly. Just in case, you know? <laughs> it's all alleged, isn't it? Even when you're here, you're not really here. Shirley was experiencing anxiety, depression, blackouts, and was often described as living in a world of fantasy. Shirley sought out therapy from Cornelia to try and deal with his issues. She knew that Cornelia had a special interest in DID, mainly because Cornelia explicitly told her this and also instructed her to read up on the disorder. Which sounds like a really excellent way to implant in that person's mind the idea that they have this and then give them all of the information that they need to make it look like they have this to you, to please you because that's just what's going to happen, isn't it? When the therapy began, Shirley didn't have any symptoms pertaining to multiple personalities. She talked about a history of childhood abuse and the symptoms that I mentioned earlier. However, one day, she came into Cornelia's office and claimed to be a nine-year-old girl named Peggy. Shortly thereafter, she came in claiming to be a 13-year-old named Vicky. This is just... This is just really, really, really bad science. It's just giving people the answer and then being like, hey, what's the answer? It's weak, guys, weak and kind of unethical. And by kind of unethical, I mean unethical. I'm not sure how intentional it is, though, so that's tricky. It's important to know that Shirley was considered to be highly suggestible and anxious to please Cornelia. Also, Cornelia started injecting her with our barbiturates during their sessions. Only shit. The year was 1954, so this wasn't considered out of line, but it wasn't exactly normal either. While under the influence of the drugs, Shirley began revealing more and more alters, up to a total of 16. Four years into their therapy sessions, Shirley wrote a letter to Cornelia confessing that everything was a lie. She hadn't been abused by her schizophrenic mother. Her mother wasn't actually even schizophrenic, and none of the alters were real. Cornelia read the letter and said, eh, this probably isn't important, and continued with the therapy. Who's crazy now, huh? Okay, now we're crossing the line to just straight up. I mean, just this is crazy. There are a couple of reasons that Cornelia would have disregarded this letter. The more mundane reason is that she was a Freudian. As such, she could have seen Shirley's confession as an attempt to resist her treatment. That wouldn't have been the only time the ghost of Freud interfered with the treatment, as Cornelia also was allegedly accessing repressed memories of Shirley's, another thing that actually doesn't exist. Yeah, we talked about... I made a video about repressed memories, and then I made it... it we touched on it again in a recent episode. It's, uh, it's like a crazy crazy old thing i mean it's also a possibility sh that she ignored that letter because she thought oh maybe this was written by like one of the more dominant there is a hair in my glasses that i'm just trying to remove <laughs> uh, there's also people wondering what i'm doing there with my hands if you're listening to this podcast you're probably thinking what am i talking about but we also have a youtube version i'm just like moving my glasses around like crazy and i just wanted to explain it was a little eyebrow or something uh, i forgot what i was talking about let's just move on oh the other reason that she might have sent the letter she thought it could be sent by one of the like personalities to try and get rid of the um the therapy and just be left alone with the multiple personality stuff so okay the much more cynical reason that cornelia could have ignored the letter is that she was actively giving lectures and presentations on the case and that she'd already secured a book deal the three faces of e was a best-selling book the year before but eve only ever had three personalities at a time with 16 different personalities shirley was cornelia's cash cow but that obviously wouldn't work if it was all a lie so the letter was buried look for whatever reason that happens that's um it's not good, is it? It's a massive conflict of interest. So I kind of like would like people who work in the medical field to be 
you know, more ethical, kind of above that, above that exploitation, but I guess not. Cornelia was already Shirley's drug dealer, but that could be chalked up to medical treatment. However, she was also paying Shirley's rent and buying her clothes. They would spend 14 to 18 hours together every week in therapy sessions. Oh my god, she's at therapy basically part-time. And Cornelia would even spend time at Shirley's house outside of therapy. I cannot possibly stress enough that even by 1950 standards, none of this was okay. Cornelia had essentially created the threat of mutually assured destruction, so Shirley never brought up the confession again. Yeah, therapy in the past. I always think of um, Mad Men when, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Betty, Don Draper's wife, is a therapy uh, and like psychiatry and she's talking about all of her problems with the doctor. And then the doctor just phones up Don and discusses her treatment and what's been bothering her and all of this stuff. And I'm like, holy shit, this would not fly today. That's a huge invasion of privacy. Even if it's your kids, can the therapists, the psychiatrists and stuff tell you what your kids have been saying in therapy? I imagine that shit's got to be confidential, right? Even between uh, child and, and doctor, right? Although that's legally complicated because the parents are in charge. So I don't know how that works. That's interesting. There was just one problem with trying to write the book. Other than Shirley's confession, Cornelia wasn't actually a good writer. There was just one problem with trying to write the book other than Shirley's confession. Cornelia wasn't actually a good writer. She may have been able to write a scholarly paper, not that she could get one published about this case because DID was almost universally considered to be fictional back then, so no scientific journal would allow it, but she lacked the ability to convey the story through compelling prose. I don't think that's how it works with scientific journals, is it? Like, uh, it was almost universally considered to be fictional, so no scientific journal would allow it. Isn't the point of journals that that's where we explore things? Like, an academic journal would be like, okay, so, so obviously it would be peer-reviewed. But if someone comes to a journal and is like, hey, I've got this study on like multiple personalities, will you look at it? And then it will be peer-reviewed, and if it turns out to be legit, they'll publish it. Isn't that... I don't know. Am I misunderstanding that? Like, scientific journals are open-minded. That's the nature of scientific journals, right? They're open to new ideas. It's where new ideas are literally talked about for the first time openly. To that end, author Flora Schreiber was brought in to write the story. Unfortunately for Cornelia, Flora was a good writer who wanted to do her due diligence. She found many parts of the story to be highly dubious, but neither Cornelia nor Shirley changed their story, so Flora pressed onwards. She would even go so far as to find Shirley's written confession, but Cornelia told her that it was absolutely inconsequential and to not dare mention it in the book. Shirley's probably thinking right now, there's a more interesting story here than a book about the multiple personality girl, but there's a story about the multiple personality girl and her psychiatrist. That is an interesting, because I mean, it's the story we're reading now and it's super interesting. That's a better book. Flora continued writing, and the other two continued their therapy sessions. By this point, it was 1965, and the pair had been spending a suspicious amount of time in therapy together. I guess it takes a long time to meticulously craft the perfect non-fiction narrative that they could relay to Flora. However, the book needed to have a happy ending. If Shirley couldn't be cured, the book wasn't going to have the impact they needed to make in order to get those fat stacks of cash. So, after 11 years of intensive therapy, and definitely boundary crossing. Cornelia told Shirley, I'm going to need you to go ahead and fuse all those personalities together now, please, and uh, well, thank you. After only a few weeks, all of the alters were gone, leaving only Shirley. The perfect ending to the perfect book. To recap, Shirley had no history of expressing multiple personalities before seeking unrelated treatment from Cornelia, a doctor who was extremely interested in DID. During their therapy, a highly suggestible and drugged out patient revealed 16 alters, attempted to confess that it was all a lie, and was told to cram it. After 11 years of therapy, with no progress, Cornelia demanded Shirley give her book a happy ending, and that was instantly the end of Shirley's alters. And oh my god, is this clearly and very much allegedly total bullshit. My opinion. That is the psychiatrist who consulted on Billy Milligan's case leading to his verdict. To reiterate, the book and movie were both extremely popular, and the movie had come out the year before Billy's trial. So also to reiterate, while I'm confident that none of these details surrounding Sybil are contested, uh, there were never any charges of fraud or malpractice. There were accusations, but no official charges, so we'll throw another allegedly in there just in case. I can't possibly overstate the profound effect that the book and subsequent movie had on both public perception of DID and psychiatric practice. Before Sybil was released, there were only 79 documented cases of multiple personalities in research literature throughout the entire world. Within 10 years, that number had increased to 6,000. By the year 2000, it increased all the way to 40,000 cases, which isn't surprising. I think like when someone opens up a new field of research, of course there's going to be more people identifying cases of that. 
But I also think that in this case, it's kind of bullshit. Your immediate reaction might be that Sybil simply raised awareness of the condition. Oh, there we go. That was exactly my initial reaction. Um, that's absolutely a thing that can and does happen. But what sort of measurable impact can simply raising awareness have? Double the number of people coming forward with present sim- that present symptoms? Triple? No matter how generous you're being, raising awareness alone cannot account for the number of cases growing by a factor of 500. Okay, I mean, sure. But what if it's like, I'm sure there are common, like, post-traumatic stress disorder wasn't a thing, and then it was a thing, and now obviously there's a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder in all sorts of different fields. And it's definitely, I'm sure, more than 500 times. So, I don't know. I think that does happen. Do I still think it's total bullshit? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> if DID were actually that common before Sybil was released, it wouldn't have been a condition that was thought to be either extremely rare or potentially non-existent. It seems impossible to argue that the influence Sybil had on society as a whole, the fame it brought to Cornelia, and the fact that Cornelia herself consulted on Billy's diagnosis did not play a massive role in his not guilty verdict. After the trial. Now that we fully understand Billy's supposed condition and how exactly he was able to be found not guilty by reason of insanity, it's time to see how the rest of his life played out. Oh god, is he going to go on and do more raping? Is he going to be let off on this absurd defense by his absolutely incredible lawyers and then we're all going to regret it? I get the feeling the answer is yes. Or maybe he's going to go to an insane asylum forever. Standard practice would have been to transfer him to the Lima State Hospital for the criminally insane. That was considered to be a brutal hellhole, so his lawyers instead were able to get him sent to Athens Mental Health Center. Just so there's no confusion, Lima and Athens are not both cities in Ohio. <laughs> Billy hasn't left the state. As Billy settled into his small room at the facility in Athens, the campus rapist looked out the window and enjoyed his beautiful view of the neighboring Ohio University. The trial and verdict had been a huge media spectacle, and Billy was now the center of attention. He was given preferential treatment and an astonishing amount of leeway, something for which his attending physician, Dr. David Call, would receive a ton of shit. While staying in the mental health center, Billy was frequently visited by OU Creative Ro- oh, Ohio University, OU. Creative writer Professor David Keyes, the award-winning Earth author of Flowers for Algernon. He had won the rights to write about Billy's life in a story, which will become his next award-winning book, The Minds of Billy Milligan. I've never heard of The Minds of Billy Milligan. It was at Athens during his treatment with David that Billy first manifested the existence of the teacher. Once David became aware of this fused personality, Billy basically had his run of the place. He was allowed virtually unrestricted access within the hospital, on the grounds outside, and even given permission to wander around the town unsupervised. David even coached him in how to handle residents that might not be happy to see their friendly neighborhood rapist walking around freely. Billy was allowed to sell his artwork, and another doctor noted that while normal patients weren't allowed to carry more than $20 on their person, Billy would frequently walk around with wads of cash. He also got to throw some sort of raucous party at the hospital, and it was reported that he tried to escape as well. Why he needed to escape from free free room and board, celebrity status, and the ability to pretty much live his free life is beyond me. But all good things come to an end, and he wound up being and he wound up having to go to the Lima State Hospital after being accused of crimes against female patients at the hospital. Oh what a surprise. He continued his ways. Also, why are the female patients at the hospital with a male rapist? They should be at different hospitals. He should be at a hospital with just men, or just himself, to be honest. The hospital in Lima eventually closed, and Billy was bounced around from hospital to hospital for several years before wind- finally winding up back in Athens in 1982. However, none of the doctors at the other facilities believed in Billy's diagnosis, so he wasn't given any special treatment. He did marry the sister of another patient while at one of the other hospitals, but the hospital didn't allow for conjugal visits, so Billy missed out on what may have been his first ever chance. A consensual sex. Though she had been excited to have the opportunity to marry a celebrity, his wife received an annulment after only 51 days of marriage because, well, Billy was just awful. After returning to Athens, Billy was again the recipient of special and inappropriate treatments while driving a truck through town, something he was apparently allowed to do. He pass- his passenger fired a gun at a random barn. What are you up to? Billy was charged with vandalism, perjury, and witness intimidation related to the incident, but the charges were eventually dropped. How is he not going to prison? He's got to go to prison. Come on. He was also involved in a shooting at the home of one of the hospital staff members, a place he absolutely should not have been allowed to be. Somehow, no charges were brought against him, and he was transferred to Central Ohio Psychiatric Hospital. It was now 1986, and Billy had been bouncing to hospital to, from hospital to hospital for the last seven years. Enough was enough. It was time to break out. 
How do you need to break out? You seem to have lots of freedom to just go want you were driving a car. Just keep driving. This time he succeeded in his escape attempt. Thanks to the help of loyal Billy sympathizers, most of whom were family members, he was able to travel from Ohio all the way to Washington State. I have no idea. I know where Washington State is. That's like in the right up in the uh, north west. I have no idea where Ohio was. If someone told me Ohio was in the south, I'd be like, okay. If someone told me it was close to Massachusetts, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> Ohio is just feel like one of those states where it's like uh, in the middle somewhere, America. For Simon's sake, that's from a technically Midwest but mostly Eastern state all the way to the West Coast, three time zones away. How can a state be in the Midwest but also mostly Eastern? What does that mean? It's just somewhere in the middle, isn't it? But it's three time zones, that's far. Once in Washington, he did what any fugitive would do. He changed his name to Christopher Carr and started a hot tub company with two other men. To be clear, these other two men had their own bodies. Oh, as in they're not part of his multiple personality thing. Billy was living with a roommate by the name of Michael Madden, a war veteran. One day, their landlord saw the two men having a fight. It was the last time anyone would see Michael alive or otherwise. While living together, Billy and Michael had shared a post office box. Coincidentally, just after Michael disappeared, Billy cashed his disability checks, cashed in the 7,500 GI Bill payment for Michael's tuition at Western Washington University, and sold off Michael's car. He allegedly murdered Michael Dinney and stole all his shit. When later questions about it, Billy claimed that the money was a repayment of a loan that he had given Michael. There was absolutely no body and no evidence other than the highly suspicious, highly suspicious theft of all of Michael's shit immediately after he disappeared, so no charges were ever filed. For those keeping score, this is now that is now two people that Billy is believed to have murdered. But Billy wasn't questioned about Michael's disappearance until much later. After acquiring the repayment of his generous loan to Michael, Billy fled to Miami, Florida. He was captured shortly thereafter and returned to the psychiatric hospital of Ohio. Why has he not returned to a court? so they can put him in prison, like, properly this time. By this point, he must have been sick of living in hospitals, hence the previous escape. It was time for Billy to merge his alters into a single personality, so that he could be declared cured little more than a year so that he could be declared cured. Little more than a year after his apprehension in Florida, doctors declared his personalities fused. Definite rapist and potential murderer Billy Milligan was a free man. He's just gonna go on to do more crimes. I'm sure he is. He's already he's like he's had his chances. He's had his second chance. And then he was at the hospital. And he was inappropriate with the female uh, inmates or the, the patients. Sorry, not inmates. And now this. He wanted to make the most of his freedom, so he traveled to California, where he was again treated like a celebrity. While there, he met with director James Cameron to discuss making a movie about his life. Cameron began work on the movie in 1991. But it never materialized. The movie may, may never have been made, but there were plans to produce a movie called The Crowded Room that would feature Leonardo DiCaprio as Billy. No way. They still say it's coming, but it looks like it's an extension of the project begun by Cameron back in the 90s, so it may be stuck in development hell for forever. A television show of the same name is currently filming that stars Tom Holland, though the show is only going to be loosely based on Billy's life. Really? It's so... I mean, I guess it's a, an interesting movie concept, but it's just so fake. Which I know is what movies are, so okay. But back to the real Billy. He mostly fell off the radar after his brief stint in California. In 1991, he was released from all state oversight, having now maintained his status of being cured. However, it turns out that the free room and board he received wasn't so free after all. He was expected to pay back all the money that his stays at all the psychiatric facilities cost, which totaled $450,000, which was money he absolutely didn't have, so he declared bankruptcy in 1996. Yeah, of course he did. Where's he gonna get 450 grand? Also, can a state be like, you have to go to psychiatric hospital and pay for it? That seems crazy. It would be like, listen, mate, I know you just did seven years in prison, but it was really expensive for the state to keep you in prison, so you're gonna have to pay us back. That would be insane. In 2000, he was able to pull himself out of bankruptcy, but he never amounted to much. His sister, Kathy Jo, purchased a mobile home for him. She had been vocal about how she felt the newspapers mistreated her brother, as well as being vocal about the horrific childhood Chalmer had put them through, especially Billy. Billy would live in that mobile home, keeping to himself and painting until he died of cancer in 2014 at the age of 59. At least, mostly. There are some other light misdemeanors here and there, but he never committed a serious crime after being released from the psychiatric facilities in Ohio. And I'm genuinely surprised at that. At least it was never a crime he got caught for. But wow, I kind of thought, you know, it's like he's got a pattern, doesn't he? And he li he's, in my opinion, he was a liar. Wrap up. So what do you think? Was Billy a rapist and a murderer who, with the help of his clever lawyers, was able to capitalize on DID being at the forefront of the public consciousness and escape any semblance of justice? I think Billy was unwell. I think he was a rapist. I think we don't know if he was a murderer. Um, all in my opinion. 
So I think that's where I stand on that. Or did you look past my dismissive editorializing about his condition and decide he really was suffering from a severe break from reality? He could have been suffering from a break from reality. Um... Did he have all these personalities inside him? I don't think so. I think he was faking, resulting in him being genuinely unaware of the crimes he committed. If I'm right in that it was all an act, then he was a manipulative shitbag who got away with everything without ever having to learn his lesson or properly pay for his crimes. If I'm wrong, then the staff at the Athens Mental Health Center did him a huge disservice by treating him like royalty instead of properly treating his condition. In the latter scenario, they may have essentially succeeded in integrating all of his personalities, but only after he had allegedly murdered two people, murders that could have been prevented if his treatment were handled more responsibly. And honestly, does it really matter one way or the other for his victims? Whether it was Billy or Adelana who raped them at gunpoint, their pain and suffering would have been the same. Even worse, because of the media sensation and that his defense sparked, they would have had to see his stupid face plastered on every television and newspaper for months, forcing them to relive their pain. And now, movies and TV shows and all sorts of nonsense told about him, which I just feel is giving way too much uh fame infamy to someone who doesn't deserve it anyway this has been an episode of the casual criminals thank you kevin for writing it thank you dear listener or viewer if you're watching on youtube also goes out as a podcast and on youtube thank you for watching thank you for listening if you want to leave a review that'd be grand if you're on youtube leave a like leave a subscribe and i'll see you next time Bye.